Yes, um, I will speak in English, um, although I'm German and I live in Austria. Um, yes, refugee camps is a story in itself. And we will have to think about refugee camps in a different way, as right now we know even Europe is again faced with a major refugee crisis, which we perceive as a threat, rather seeing it as an opportunity. And I will take you now for the few minutes I have uh, with you through what it means to change from an approach of refugee camps as a threat, as a, in fact a storage facility for things, and you unpack them months and years later into an opportunity. So first we will go into a little teaser. <laughs> walk across the desert and sometimes they get lost and sometimes they get lost we're sometimes building a temporary lost. city in the desert city in the while desert. people are coming this is a beautiful example of how it should not be <laughs> So what we're seeing is, is um, many more refugees coming across, uh, wounded, injured, traumatised. Well, as you have seen, children of this age stealing a police station. If we don't work together, who is going to do this? Tonight we expect 900. We have had up to 3,000, 4,000 people in one night coming here. Anywhere else in the world, it takes 20 years to set up a functioning community. We did it in months. It is now coming to real life. In 2012, on the 29th of July 2012, there was a piece of a desert. And that piece of the desert was designed, designated by the government of Jordan, together with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, to become a refugee camp. And what happened there was humanitarian organizations, non governmental organizations, under the coordination of UNHCR, setting up tents. You will see one tent out here. There's one put up uh, in one of the installations. That is what every refugee family or every five individuals get when they come in. And you heard me saying tonight we're expecting 900. We had up to 3,000 people coming in one night. So that's what is happening when there's an emergency. Tents, water, the famous 18 liters of water of clean water per day, per person, which is the humanitarian standard. That's what you flushed down in one toilet go this morning, yourself, in Austria or somewhere else. Um, tents and rows, communal toilets, communal showers, communal kitchens, once you have is issued the first hot meals, that is how we see and we perceive refugee crisis response dealing with many people in distress, many people who have lost everything. We try to make them all the same, we make them into 100,000 times the same as it was in the camp. They eat the same, they dress the same, they live the same way, and so on. Now one big discovery, and that was happening very fast in Zatari, 10 kilometers from the Syrian border in northern Jordan. 10 kilometers from the war. We could hear the war. Something was happening. The people rebelled. The people actually rebelled against what they perceived as inhuman. Inhuman because it was standardizing everybody and putting everybody in this, in, in, in this space 
um, into the category, now you're a refugee, now you all live the same way. You all forget about your identity, forget about being people, forget about human beings, you're now a number, your registration number. You have a card which entitles you to certain things. So that's what happened. And in their minds they said, what's wrong with these people? Why are they trying to tell us how we have to dress, to eat, and so on? So they started to do something we considered as criminal. You saw me looking at the electricity wires. They connected the electricity wires to the public lighting system we had up there, because it's easy, two wires and you have electricity. They moved the tents as they felt the space should be designed. They tried to create individual space. And suddenly each house looked differently. And then these containers were donated to replace the tents by many, many countries, each container about 2,000 euros, but great stuff. But what they didn't accept was to keep the container actually as a container. They actually used the pieces of the containers to put it together into different shapes. So all of that showed us one thing. The, actually, the urge, the desire to come back to what is an individual human being. I have a different house from my neighbor. My curtain looks differently. Look what fountain I have built. It is actually a sign of home away from home. The toilets was a big battle. Hundreds of communal toilets. It's funny to go to, to a common toilet, even here in, in Ars Electronica we go to a toilet where everybody goes, but it's not funny after more than, than a week or two weeks while we go on holidays. So what they did, they dismantled over 90 buildings. They destroyed them. So we called it vandalism, but they called it privatization because they took the building materials and made their own toilets with them. It's logical, we would do the same. So what happened between 2012, 29th July 2012, and the moment we actually left can be described by the next little movie, which is actually um, coming from the BBC Business Report which shows you an incredible transformation of a camp which had become a city. Staggering three kilometers from east to west, so big it's now considered Jordan's fifth largest city. And to illustrate its size, back down on the ground, a complete loop of the camp's outer ring road takes more than 20 minutes by car. And inside the camp, the number of residents has grown from a few hundred to about 120,000 people. And where there's that kind of population growth, commerce quickly follows. So this is Zatari's main business street. It's home to hundreds of shops and services. And it's so popular with Syrians and camp workers, it's been nicknamed the Champs-Élysées in reference to the bustling shopping street in the French capital, Paris. A walk along the street reveals a brisk trade in anything from mobile phone SIM cards, cigarettes, gas refills and electrical appliances. But aside from the sale of goods, services play an important part in creating a sense of normality in the camp. The owner of this business quit his beauty salon in Dara, Syria and moved to Zatari last year. The shop generates a small profit by offering haircuts at a one and a half dollar fixed price. But running a camp business is wraught with contradictions. I'm worried about lost opportunities and if I'm making the right decisions. For example, I look around me and think, should I renovate the place and expand it? And then I think, why? You're going back. Some people say the camp was better in the old days when they used to distribute meals. But I think that now is better. We can open our own shops. And the fact that this is possible is good for us. Now we're living like anyone else. And there's no better way of illustrating that point than having a look round Atef's wedding dress hire shop, a hot spot for brides to be. Women used to come here, say they have weddings and they can't find dresses. 
<coughs> so we got two dresses for rent and it worked out well. We have two weddings a day and there are people who come from outside the camp to rent dresses because it's cheaper here. The profit is not that much, but we are doing okay. Sometimes we even <coughs> take five dinars from people who can't afford to pay much. But while formal businesses thrive, so too does Zatari's black market. District gangs are known to make a handsome profit by selling on aid goods and siphoning off electricity supplies. The man tasked with tackling this issue is camp manager Killian Kleinschmidt. That's the live chicken market here. A walk around the camp reveals how his policy of encouraging business development is having a harmonizing effect. Hello. But sometimes, and in the interest of maintaining peace, even he has to turn a blind eye to the camp's more questionable business deals. Back in Mr. Kleinschmidt's meeting room, and you can't help but notice this. The interactive map once used to explain his camp strategy to US Secretary of State John Kerry. In short, district councils need to be introduced to improve law and order. We need to bring in control, manage it, but also give the freedom for people to develop their businesses and develop their capacities, develop their homes. So that's why we, as we speak, trying to put in place physical compounds, physical administration, divide the whole place into 12 districts, which allows us to actually know who is there, what they're doing, and help them to doing their things in a better way, in a more regulated way, but also in, in a free way. That's what free market economy is about. So economic theory as a way of bringing about calm and stability. But keeping the peace in a camp is not always that straightforward. At the end of a long, hot day, tempers can fray. Oh. Tear gas used by Jordanian security to disperse a frustrated crowd. A reminder that Zatri Champs-Élysées is far from its French namesake when it comes to doing business. Thank you. That was not more than 15 months after the first tent was put up on a piece of desert. Not more than 15 months later. No, it was not Treiskirchen, but uh, anyway, 15, not more than 15 months later, we saw this. When I left the camp, I quit the United Nations last year uh, on the 31st of October, there were 3,000 businesses. The Champs-Élysées had expanded. The camp had several axes, which always uh, actually had these uh, type of incredible, incredible commerces, including a major supermarket with about $300,000 investment by some Syrians who said, well, we want a real supermarket. We also estimated the uh, monthly turnover at about 12, 10 to 12 million euros within the market. We had a travel agency. You could book actually your travel, uh, especially for those who were uh, working abroad. There were some members of families working in the Gulf states, sending money back home into the camp they were actually organizing their travel with this travel agency. He didn't have a very good internet connection. He did it all by phone, but he did organize travel. So within, let's say, at that moment, two years, out of that piece of desert, we had a full city. So now, of course, the questions arise of what does it mean in the context of global refugee management? I mean, we're talking about uh, Burning Man uh, cities grow coming and going. We're talking about the number of other festivals in the world where you have somewhere in India, I believe, four million people coming and baff, and within a few hours you have a city and then it disappears again. Um, governments, however, somehow accept when it's the Burning Man or when it's a religious festival that you're setting up structures res which resemble urban, urban management, urban urban delivery of, uh, of assistance or uh, of, of services. But when it comes to refugees, they all get nervous. And I can say and, uh, that every time I use the word city for what had uh, 
clearly become a city, even though the houses didn't maybe look like uh, Vienna. Um, but every time I used the word city, the government of Jordan wrote a letter to the United Nations and saying he did it again, he said it again. Um, but it was a city. So what we also learned in there was that humanitarian organizations like my own, like UNICEF, like all the many NGOs who you will see the appeals right now especially for the region, for the Middle East and the Syria crisis, had absolutely no experience to manage this type of situation. I mean, who was I to call myself the mayor of Zatari? I had never been a mayor in my life. Yes, I had managed camps, but I had never managed a city. So what I felt was that we have to actually move and change our way of bringing capacities in such places to run them professionally. So we brought into this camp expertise of the city of Amsterdam. So we had city planners of the city of Amsterdam helping us to redesign the water system, look into the sewage system, it was actually Amsterdam Waternet. We looked into the ways of how they could help us with planning of transportation. We helped as well, we tried also to look into how would that, that city, that new grown city, fit within to the overall area of Northern Jordan with the nearby city of Mafrak was the name or is the name. How would we be able to actually improve overall services in the whole area in terms of for all the citizens, for all the people living in there, regardless of whether they were from Mars, from Syria, from Jordan, from anywhere else? Is this just a question of how human beings actually have certain services which are delivered? Now, we, on, on a side note, our experience with Amsterdam was not that great because Amsterdam city planners didn't understand that what had to be done was to move fast. Because these people, the people we are now talking about in the news every day now coming across uh, oceans and I mean Mediterranean seas and, and coming in with trucks, these people have an incredible energy. They couldn't wait until a city planner had finished planning, until the transport planner had finished planning. So they set up their own transportation systems they were continuing to, and actually to develop their own ways of organizing their habitat and organizing the areas. So it was for us constant, a constant sort of balance between having, trying to have a managed process versus a self-managed reorganization of everything else. It was with water the same thing. We discovered that uh, they were actually already doing water distribution systems because they had invested into washing machines so the washing machines needed a, a permanent water connection, so they're connected to the water tanks, the public ones, so they had their own distribution system. While we were still planning an overall water, water distribution network with pipes and with um, taps in each of the 14,000 households in this camp, in the city, in this new grown city. Um, so again, learning how to balance between a structured, a managed process and a self-organized way of doing it, giving the space to do it, when try to guide it was one, one of the keys. We also had one of the principles, and this is something we're forgetting when we look at the victims of crisis. What I'm appealing usually to people who work with that in that context and look at it and saying, put a moment aside why they're here. Just look into the fact that human beings who, who actually live in a given space and that space needs to be managed. And it should be managed in a sustainable manner so that we don't need, we actually keep people accountable for what they're doing within their space. So I was actually, I think the first one who said, a refugee in that refuse city should be actually paying for electricity should have a prepaid meter in his home and even though when most of them are actually poor and may not be able to pay for it still be held accountable for the electricity the family is using in the same way for water instead of wasting water uh, without being held accountable make people accountable for it what's wrong with this it's not because you're a refugee you're actually sick 
or you are actually totally un disabled in a way of not being capable of being respected as a human being, as a citizen in this case of a refuse city. We have seen many, many settlements in the world, and just for your information, the average lifespan, or the, let's say the average stay of a refugee in one of these big settlements in Kenya, in Congo, in anywhere, is now, unfortunately, 17 years. So I think it's worthwhile to begin to invest into something which is not just an emergency response, something where you keep people alive, but to invest into something more long-term, so it becomes actually a win-win for the people, a chance for change, and for the surroundings in that context. The whole concept of seeing, I mean, in fact, urbanization of population, and I, I would like really to stress that in most displacement situations in the world, people change and urbanize. They get displaced, they become refugees, something, they run somewhere, quite often from rural village environments, and they change so much that we will not be able to live again in that little village. And um, that we have seen here as well. And I would like to cite a wonderful example which we have seen with the little girls from southern Syria, most of the people here in this Zatari refuse city, if we can call it like this, were from southern Syria. When I left, with the help of the UEFA, the European Football Association, we had actually set up football clubs. And we had set up a sports association. 250 little girls were playing football in these clubs. They would never have played football back home in their villages. So in here we, we, we are seeing, and we had another 150 roughly, um, learning take one do. Never ever a Syrian little girl would have learned Taekwondo or football in another environment. So we are seeing displacement and refuge obviously as a crisis, but let's turn the crisis into opportunities. And I think that is what matters also in the current very emotional and at times unnecessary European debate on what we should do and how much we should close or open our borders. Thank you very much.